All right. Welcome to the July 27, 22 meeting of the Amherst Mass Conservation Commission. Um, the first agenda item, I think, is comments from the chair. That's me. Um, I don't have major up, any major updates. This is Larry's second to last meeting. Um, we have a medium full agenda tonight. There are only two hearings. Um, so the RDA for the railroad and the notice of intent for um, 46 Fearing Street will both be continued. But the two hearings we have are complex sites. Um, so we'll have a lot of details to work through. Um, I think we're gonna spend the first actually 20 to 25 minutes of the meeting talking about land use policy updates. I know, um, Michelle, you've been giving Aaron a lot of feedback, so thank you. Um, it'll be good to discuss. Aside from that, I don't have many. I have a hydrology update, drought, like D2, severe drought is moving rapidly in our direction. Um, the drought coordinator was asking us for about drought conditions and streams we're monitoring in Wheatley, for example. So um, that front is moving west rapidly. I don't know if anyone's looking at a drought update, but um, it's pretty serious in Eastern Mass and moving our way quickly. Um, that's all I have for a science update. Uh, any, do you know if Dave was gonna join tonight, Aaron? Um, he said he was going to join, but um, Jen, for some reason, it seemed like um, the attendees just popped in. So just to let you know that, I don't know why there was a delay there, but maybe they joined later, whatever, but I just figured I'd let you know. Okay. Um, oh, so then I should just repeat. Um, if you're here for the RDA for Keith Morris on behalf of New England Central Railroad Company, or the notice of intent um, for 46 Fearing Street, both of those hearings will be continued. Um, I don't think that the railroad has um, notified abutters yet, but um, 46 Fearing Street has. We continued this the last meeting and it will be continued again to our next meeting. Um, so the best thing to do, you can do to track that hearing is check our agenda. Our next regularly scheduled meeting is August 3rd. August, August 10th. August 10th. Um, the, so keep an eye on it. And the 46 fairing is going to be continued to September 14th um, okay. at 730. So just to let folks know who are trying to tune in for the um, 46 fairing, that it's continued pending um, some uh, discussions amongst uh, attorneys on all parties for that property. Okay, and I'll try to make that announcement intermittently throughout the meeting, just in case anyone else hops on. Um, okay, well, I don't see a Dave yet. So Aaron, do you want to cover some other business or would you like to jump into the land use policy discussion? Yeah, I'd say if we could jump into the land use policy, that would be great. Okay. And I don't know how you want to structure that, uh, Jen. Um, I did get comments from Michelle, um, and I haven't heard from anyone else on the land use policy, but I have Michelle's markup. So like that might be a place to start for discussion purposes, or if we just wanna talk about it, like generally speaking too, and not start digging in, that's an option as well. Um, well, let's just take a kind of a loose poll, um, commissioners. I mean, personally, I have not had time to get to it. So it's not that I have no comments. It's that I haven't engaged on it yet. Um, other commissioners, where are you guys? Have you had your heads in it at all? Or would it be more helpful to do an overview at this point than like a detailed, just feedback-based discussion? I've briefly looked at it, but not extensively. I haven't uh, been able to make any, I haven't had time to make any, uh, uh, any comments. Okay. Yeah, I'm in the same boat, um, but also nothing was like jumping out right. at me either in terms of, right. um, you know, sure, maybe some details there, but overall, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so 
Um, well, Fletcher, what do you think is the best use of this time? We have our first hearings at seven. Well, well, actually, I have a question. Um, with the enforcement uh, numbers, like, where do those come from in terms of like, you know, there's like one, two, and three, mm -hmm. so 100, 200, 300, or do you want to like go heavier? Yeah, so everything came from, I think it was the town of Weston is where like the original template came from. And that was something that KP Law had given us uh, mm. to work with like as a starting point. And I want to say it was like maybe two or three pages long, the um, template that we were handed for Weston. And then it just kind of ballooned from there. Um, so there, those numbers came from another community and I, um, have not compared that to other um other what other towns charge sure. for yeah i was just interested because it was just like 100 200 third offense 300 you know it's like mm -hmm. all right do we care do we want to be stronger on that does it matter i don't know you know mm -hmm. third offense like 300 bucks or third offense like maybe you're not a, asked to come back no mm -hmm. you know because like honestly how many times well i'm, I'm I'm not that privy to it, but like how many times are we um, having repeat offenders on conservation lands? Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't know, but um, and I don't yeah. want to I don't want to just have this conversation about enforcement money and how much it should cost. I mean, there's obviously way more important things to go, but that was just kind of like, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, it, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you're, you're talking about the term, the uh, deterrence value, uh, especially on, on, on recidivism or, or people who are coming back and doing it, doing it again. I think uh, if it's gone from 200 to 300 on, uh, on the third offense, um, maybe it could be, we could discuss it more another time, but it's. Community service? Certainly. What's that? Community service. <laughs> That's a great one. Erin, do you have a sense of where enforcements occur? Is it, you know, like in community gardens or people doing the wrong thing on conservation lands or, you know? Yeah. Is it enforced? Yeah. So I'm hearing anecdotally what has happened historically and what I know the biggest issues have been in that realm have really been um, like, we've had some issues with homelessness um, where there have been like uh, camps, encampments or like a couple tents set up on a given property and that people have kind of been um, in that general vicinity for a given period of time. And then when, by the time we figure out that people are there, to address it, usually there's a pretty big mess associated with it. A lot of times the mess that's associated with it is, you know, like a lot of trash and refuse and stuff, but it's really like toileting that's the problem. Um, and then Brad and um, his assistant, Tyler, or whomever is helping him is usually the ones who are dealing with it. And those are difficult situations relative to charging enforcement, right? It's like, you know, if people are tenting in the woods, then they're in a difficult position to be fined. Um, so those are really the only cases that I've heard. And I, I have not heard of, of um, cases where we've gone after um, violations on conservation land that the public has, um, has, has had, so. Or maybe potentially a, a butters would be another place where that could come up um and then i'm thinking like yeah and then maybe puffer's pond but generally please respond to that and it's more of like a verbal stop um yeah yeah um and i think that's what it is most of the time is sort of like these one-off situations mm -hmm. um well i could see the monetary uh enforcement being motivating for abutters who are going to have a long time to have opportunities for um, incidences um 
I don't know if, if what's on the table here is money or what kind of consequences, but. Yeah, I mean, it. I think it depends. Like, so for example, there might be situations where it's a, um, an encroachment issue. And like mm -hmm. in those types of situations, I think that ultimately the solution is to get them to remove whatever encroachments have occurred. So like if they have a shed on the property, for example, making them remove the shed, or if they've been mowing, um, making them um, uh, stop mowing and like kind of identify the boundary a little more clearly. And sorry, I'm multitasking because Dave couldn't get into the meeting. He's having all kinds of trouble getting into the CONCOM meetings. I'm mm -hmm. sending that along now. Um, but yeah, I think it's, those are sort of, it's interesting. I mean, the, I think the violation um, is an interesting thing to discuss because I don't think we've enforced it and I don't think it's ever been done. Um, but I do think it's important in the, I think sort of as Andre was saying, like if we ever get into a situation where there's parties going on or who knows what the future might hold. So it's a good, it's good to be prepared so that we have something to point to um, and have something that's reasonable that people aren't just gonna say like, oh, who cares, $300 fine. Mm -hmm you know, I don't really care if I have to pay that, I'll just pay it and do it again. Um, but I, again, I don't really see that happening very often. I think it's a pretty rare, rare situation that we're going to have enforcement on the conservation areas for use violations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think like from my time on here, it's really, if there is anything, it usually gets, to, if it's to a different certain level, it just really goes to the police department. Right. You know? Did that ever get resolved? Remember a couple, a couple of years ago, someone had like the satanic signs up over near Echo Hill or something. Yeah, yeah, I remember like, that. Um, like, what do you do? <laughs> like Hong Kong, right? Wins, uh, document saying, hmm, I don't know. Yeah, and, that, and like you said, like it's like you know, or it's homelessness, and it's like, all right, well, is that a trespass? Like, how do you deal with that? And obviously, you can't find people. It's not going to work. That doesn't help. And yeah, it's a tricky. It gets tricky yeah because like also who would like issue the enforcement like the conservation department you like you know what i mean yeah like, yeah like, and no, that's probably like, the police department they'll give them the verbal like hey like don't do this again and hopefully that works you know i don't know right right it's like yeah i don't see dave zomack out there with a the ticket book being like <laughs> you know yeah no it's but, a good it's a good point even for wetland protection act stuff generally for for violations, what we're um, what we're doing to deal with that is the inspections department has a ticket system, and ordinarily with the ticket system, the way that it works is that I believe you give a warning, and then um, if the violation continues, then um, you issue you issue the tickets, but the tickets have to be issued daily. So, for example, like they might give a warning one day then the next day ticket number one the next day ticket number two and they actually have to be handwritten out and one copy goes to the owner or violator one copy goes to um the magistrate of our local uh court and then the other goes to um or is kept by the conservation department or the inspections department and then you know, so you can see that that becomes a, an incredible administrative burden to do that day after day because you're writing this out, you're sending it to multiple parties. Um, and then you have to, if it's, there's no payment of the fee, then there's a collection process, which is taking the person right. to court. A lot of times I've heard that once you get to that point where it goes, goes to court for payment, usually it gets thrown out. Um, so it can be all for naught, but it's an interesting question and discussion because it's an inspection department ticket system as opposed mm. to like a wetland, uh, you know, wetlands conservation department or, you know, conservation land ticket system. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind mm. of curious, right, like, like what other like, towns like, do. Like, catch, yeah, catch somebody like dumping tires on the couch and mattress or something on Hong Kong land. Well, um, 
so one thing that the preserves that you know the organization I work with has a lot of trouble is is um, abutters like dumping lawn waste or landscaping oh. waste. So it's just like, or maybe like their plantings keep kind of creeping into conservation mm -hmm. land because they, they live next to it so long and it's not maybe well used. So they sort of like increasingly adopt it as their own. Um, and you don't necessarily figure that out right away, but then you see sort of like someone's compost pile. Um, so I think it is important to have some kind of mechanism of enforcement just for that. And then other things obviously are more complex um, and nuanced in enforcement. Mm -hmm. But do you guys think that the the fees as they are now seem reasonable? Do you think they're not high enough? Do you think we should do some um, checking of what other towns do for similar policies? Well, that was my, that's actually where it came from. My first, that my question came from was I feel like the third violation was 300 bucks, just went up another hundred bucks. I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's cumulative, but still. Right. It's not like you're losing your license, with like your DUI. Right. Maybe, exactly. maybe there shouldn't be a, maybe it, it should not be hundred, hundred. I mean, it should be hundred and then 200, like third violation. That's, that's a lot of violations that you knew what you were doing wrong and you did it again. Yeah, I see what you're saying, Fletcher. It seems maybe yeah. so incremental. I think looking at some other towns to see what uh, what they're doing is a good idea. I mean, it seems like that's where that's what you did from the beginning. Um, but maybe a couple other towns, and yeah, I mean, if uh, if it's just going up a hundred bucks each time, it and I don't really know the laws i don't know what the maximum allowable would be so i don't know if maybe 300 is the, the maximum but right. uh you know doubling it from one to 200 200 to 400 or something like that uh could see what like the police department does or something for or like you know right mm -hmm. isn't it funny when you like drive down the street and there's like a no littering sign it says maximum fine 250 dollars you're like mm -hmm. Like, so like where'd that number come from, right? Like 250 bucks, yeah. I can just throw my can of hydraulic <laughs> off the can on the side of the road. Yeah. I don't know. So um, it, yeah, and in criminal courts, those I numbers mean, come from something. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, um, in criminal courts, what they'll do, you know, on sentencing or whatever is they're looking at the, uh, the past past violations. And they'll take that into account when, you know, when handing down sentences and it's the, the reason for it is, is exactly what we're talking about is to stop the, uh, the actions. And, um, you know, uh, just along the same vein, um, just because somebody uh, commits a violation doesn't mean that they need a ticket. You know, it's uh, like Aaron was saying before, there are other, um, solutions uh such as you know mitigation uh or just stopping what you, what they're doing or um but it 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 does i mean uh, it it's important to make sure that there's a disincentive for people to continue violating i i don't know how much time we have for this but um Maybe I could just pivot a second in case you guys do have a, a chance to look at the land use policy more for next time, because Aaron and I talked a little about the mission statement and I just wanted, like I learned something, so I just wanted to pass it on for context, which is sort of that the, the conservation operates on two tracks in terms of our responsibilities. One's the wetlands administration and then one is the land use policy and they're two disparate areas. So when I was reviewing, um, and working on the mission statement, like I had something in there about wetland administrating, administering the state and local bylaws, but that's actually not relevant to this particular mission statement. So when you're, so when you're reading it, I guess take it, take it in the context that this is the focus, is specifically the land use and the conservation lands of, of the town of Amherst. So a different track than wetland. And that was just some guidance that Aaron gave that I thought I'd pass on. That's super helpful, Michelle, because I remember last time we talked about this, you know, that was part of our mission that we were considering. So mm -hmm. but 
enforcement side. Yeah. There was in, in Michelle's draft and I can try to share that too. If, if you guys want to have a look at the markups, but um, she had mentioned, you know, um, administration of the, the wetlands protection act and protecting wetlands and waterways and stuff. And I think that I don't, <laughs> from my perspective, it all ties together very, um, sort of, I don't know, they kind of work together, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Um, when we're protecting the land, we're also protecting the water. And so, and that also we have to follow the same rules as everybody else, right? So if, um, if we're putting in a bridge on conservation area, we still have to have the property delineated. We still have to have it surveyed. We still have to put a plan together. We still have to put an application together. We still have to notify abutters, hold a public hearing, go through the same exact procedures. So I don't think it's necessarily having to separate it so much as um, just making sure it's clear that, as Michelle said, there are two, two different sets of legislation that um, dictate the Conservation Commission's role. Right, I guess there is, so mm, I don't know if I'm totally agreeing with what you're saying, Erin. I'm glad, I'm appreciative of the clarification on the separation, right? Like if the land use plan is to identify, you know, how we're managing the resources that the town owns that are under our jurisdiction, that's one thing. I think there's actually opportunity for conflict, right? Because if we're the, if we were actually talking about land use planning, like the idea that we want to think about what the future landscape of Amherst looks like, then we're weighing in more on things like setbacks, like zoning regulations, like things that we come up against in hearings that aren't in our jurisdiction, right? Like often yeah. in these hearings, for example, when, when an applicant is proposing, for example, turning a bylaw regulated wetland into a driveway, you know, our answer, you know, what we want to say is, can't you just make this property smaller? But that's not our job in that context, right? But in the context of planning and have, sorry, that was some weird, did you guys just get echo? But anyway. You might, mute, you might have to mute yourself, bud. Sorry. Um, like, it just seems like that actually is more in the avenue of like that hat that we wear, right? Like the idea that under our land use, like land use job, we could be integrating and, uh, integrating and engaging in town planning. You know, Amherst has a really large percentage of conserved like conservation land in our town relative to other towns and municipalities in Massachusetts. So like, I think it's important to make that distinction. Yeah, you, the point you're yeah. making is really well taken, Jen. And it's a challenge that I've run into again and again in this job. Um, I'll give you an example. So we had like, I'll use another town as an example, but it, it fades into Amherst. Like uh, I, I was serving as, uh, conservation agent where I'm doing sort of the wetlands administration on one side and then on the other side is land management and there was a, a trail committee that um, came up with a plan to put in a series of footbridges on a piece of conservation land and they <laughs> did their best to put together a proposal before the conservation commission to get it approved and when they brought it before the concom I was like you know it doesn't meet bankful requirements, the openness ratio is not correct, you know, the, you know, that they hadn't delineated, there was no wetland delineation associated with, there was so many issues. And it really created kind of a challenge for me because I was like, okay, so here I'm in the role of administering, but now I'm also in the role of like designing and putting permits through and it's almost a conflict of interest, right? And, and it's the same way for the Conservation Commission let's say you know that there's a bridge that needs to be installed, but at the same time, we're planning for a bridge, we're also the ones approving the bridge. And so Daisy and I have had a lot of conversations about how to reconcile that and how we have done that is a lot of times, you know, hiring outside consultants to do so, sort of the design work and making sure we hold ourselves to that high standard as far as um, delineation and design that meets all those regs. So I could 
review it and still sit in that chair and review their work and say, you need to fix this, you need to fix that to make it comply. Um, and also like sort of from a design standpoint that like we have a land manager and a, a land management assistant. And so hopefully they're doing sort of some of the conceptual, we need a bridge here thought process. And then I can guide that from my hat of wetlands administration to make sure they're doing it right. Um, but I think it's a, it, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And it's, it might be something that we want to include to say the conservation commission st uh, or staff of the town supports the, the visioning and the design components and the conservation commission maintains its role. Or I don't know. I mean, I'm just trying yeah, to- it's tough. it's tricky. Yeah, outline sort of how the commission handles those situations. Right. I can think of numerous examples just in the time I've been on this conservation commission where we've come up against that. The Casey Trail Bridge, like off Southeast Street is one really good example. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, sorry. So we're at the start time for our first hearing. I think we should keep things moving. Um, what, so maybe we should double down on actually reading and giving Aaron comments in writing before our next meeting. And I'm, I need to hold myself to that more than I need to hold you guys to it. But um, is that a reasonable next step from, from, for everyone? Yeah, right. I mean, till August 10th. You guys don't have to mark it up if you don't want to. You could make notes on a napkin and just bring it to the meeting if that's more convenient yeah. for you. Right. Read my mind, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the draft? If you search your email, Aaron sent it to us, I think on June 30th. June 30th. With the, with the latest markups? Yeah. Okay. Oh, not with Michelle's feedback. Okay. Um, we have to individually respond to Aaron and then she kind of has to collate that. We can't like see each other's markups outside if, of if, this forum. yeah so there's no way for you guys to see what i put in there like if we like share it on the screen real quick and then it becomes record yeah um, no absolutely i feel I like that I... could be useful um can work okay. out my markup yeah so we'll just share it and then you know and i've done this before too with with papers that were like peer reviewed and there was multiple authors where one person looked at it and marked it up and then we reviewed that and then another person marked it up and reviewed that so that it was kind of um, a little more structured and we weren't just getting comments on all different versions. Um, well, so but, that's one thing we could do is somebody could volunteer to be the next, next reviewer. Mm -hmm. um, I could do that. Fletcher, you seem like you've also kind of looked at it. Would you be in a position to do that by August 10th? Review, just be the reviewer, sure. The I next mean, person kind of take, now that Mich we've seen Michelle's comments in this public forum, that can be shared. Yeah, fine, just send me those, send me that, yeah. Michelle's, um, that'd be fine. Um, and I do have one more question about the agricultural policy. Did we, I, I forget if we talked about this or not, is the Ag Commission, weighing in on this on that part that yeah so we deal? pulled in we pulled in from the um agricultural committee we pulled in information we've pulled in information from multiple areas um okay. so it's not like i've drafted this it's well do the the agricultural um and agricultural license policy was actually completely already developed and I just inserted it in here so that we would have sort of a comprehensive policy. So to answer your question, yes. Yeah, cool. That was my other question. I forgot my napkin though. I didn't have it. Right <laughs> All right, so that, I think that's a good plan. Um, Fletcher, if you'll be next reviewer and then we can decide after that how we move forward. Is that okay, Aaron? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Yep. I will. I'm just flipping through here so you guys can see. This is a public. This is Michelle's comments on the public record here. I'm gonna forward them along to Fletcher. Fletcher will 
do his markups and then they'll forward on to the next person. Okay, perfect. And then we can review the meeting by meeting maybe. That might be a good strategy to get us through. Keep things moving, yeah. Thank you Fletcher for doing that next rev. Um, okay, so keeping it moving, I think wasn't 7.30 our first? Yes. Okay, so let me just quickly make an announcement because um, we have a lot of participants right now. We have 20 or 15 attendees here. Um, I want to let people know that if you're here either for the hearing, the RDA scheduled for 7.30 p.m., which is um, New England Central Railroad Company, or for the notice of intent um, for the application at 46 Fearing Street, which was scheduled for 7.45, both of those are continued to the September 14th meeting. So um, abutters haven't even been notified for the railroad. Hopefully they'll be notified before that September 14th meeting. But 46 Fearing Street, if you are an abutter and you've been notified, you will not get another notification. You have to mark September 14th on your calendar and check the agenda beforehand to see the time. Aaron, do you have a comment? Just one, just one correction, which is the the, 46 fairing is being continued to September 14th. The railroad is being continued to August 10th. Um, and that's, oh, it, it was an error in the PowerPoint. Oh, okay. So I apologize for that. That was okay. my fault. Okay. Okay. Long story short, if you're here for 46 fairing street, which is my guess, oh, several of these people are September 14th, mark it on your calendar, check the agenda beforehand to see um, what time that hearing will be. Um, Okay, so is anyone from the railroad coming to this meeting, Erin, or are we just, we're continuing because they haven't done a butter notification yet, correct? That's a great question. Um, I invited the railroad to come tonight um, if they wanted to discuss the butter notification. Keith, Keith Morris said he was trying to get permission from the railroad to do the butter notifications. Um, and so I invited him to come if he wanted to talk about it. He, I think his, his idea was to wait and see what the railroad said. And then if the railroad is still not um, wanting to notify butters that he might be back. And that's why I moved it to August 10th. So it wouldn't, it would still give us an opportunity to discuss it with him um, if we need to on that day. Okay. But he's not coming to this. I don't believe so. He don't didn't know. confirm that he was attending. Okay. Okay. So then folks, I think we're just looking for a motion to continue the public hearing December to September 14th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, I'm sorry, August. August, I was, August 10th. Oh, I'll August pull it up 10th. on the screen. Sorry. sorry, that was my, I, I created that confusion by accident because originally he had asked for the September 14th continuation. Yeah. And I said, well, I think we should, um, have it on the on the 10th just in case something comes up that we need to yeah, discuss. Yeah, it's, it's my bad, Erin. I just downloaded the older version of the PowerPoint. I was looking at that instead. No problem. Okay, motion to continue the public hearing to August 10th, 2022 at 7.45 p.m. I'll make the motion to uh, move to get about the public hearing of the uh, New England Central Railroad request for termination to August 10th, 7.45 p.m. Second. I got Larry on the second. Voice vote, Andre. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. And I'm also an aye. All right. Um, the next one is a continuation. It's a notice of intent. Mark Stinson on behalf of Wilson Property Group LLC for construction of a single family house and associated site work in the buffer zone to BVW at Lot 2 Canton Avenue. Um, so I think I saw Mark, um, if you are in attendance and would like to kind of, uh, speak to, or are the applicant for this hearing, would you raise your hand and I will promote you. Um, Mark Stinson. Carol Wilson. That might be Pete Wilson. Yeah. And Jen, I think that we're opening this for the first time tonight, just as an FYI. Okay, I have to I go. Um, you don't have the language right on hand, do you? Oh. Upstairs. 
I don't. I'll run upstairs. Mary Anderson. So just we might want to be clear that pu the public comment session would be later on in the proceeding. Okay. That might be who. I'm not sure if Mary Anderson is an applicant, part of the application group okay. or if she's a neighbor. Pete should be here too somewhere. Okay, I see Carol Wilson. I'm wondering if that's Pete. Probably. All right. If you guys can just sort this out, I'm going to just run up and get the NOI language. Okay, uh, this is Pete Wilson. Hey, Hi, Pete. Pete. Hi there, everyone. Good evening. We're just waiting for the chair to get um, the opening, the language for opening a public hearing, which is upstairs. So she's running to grab it and coming right back. Okay, thanks. Okay, sorry. Um, this public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, <clears throat> an act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended and Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. So, <laughs> um, Mark, welcome. Thank and you. Is that Pete? Are you here? Yes, I am. Good evening. Okay, great. Thank you guys for being here. Um, I'm sure you're familiar, familiar with how this goes, but um, just an overview of how we usually do this is we'd ask you to... Um, introduce yourselves and give kind of a five minute overview of the application. Um, usually what we do is if you want to share a screen or Erin can share her screen with the most recent plan. I know, um, Mark, you submitted a revised plan with some markups on it. We can talk through that. Um, then we can talk through any updates from town staff. Um, and then we'll open for public comment. Um, we'll ask that members of the public um, limit their comments and questions to two minutes and keep it um, jurisdictional for us, so relevant to protections of wetland and water resources in the site. Um, and then we will go through com any commissioner comments and questions. Um, and hopefully for this application, it seems like we have what we need in order to move forward. Um, so hopefully we'll have a detailed discussion of conditions, um, including any kind of public comment um, and move forward from there. Uh, so Mark, do you want to kind of introduce yourself in the project and share screen or would you like Aaron to? Yeah, well, I prefer Aaron share the screen that uh, okay. revised plan. So my name is Mark Stinson. I've been retained by Pete Wilson uh, to submit the notice of intent. I think most of you are familiar with the property. Uh, Pete was not the applicant for the notice of intent submitted in 2017 that received the order. He didn't buy the property until 2019. And then, you know, the commission, there was a violation. Uh, Ward Smith uh, updated the wetlands out there, took care of the violation. I think Aaron satisfied that the violation's been, or the enforcement order has been complied with. That's my understanding. So this is just lot, what is it, lot two? Just the smaller lot. There's no wetlands alteration proposed. This is strictly buffer zone. So if you've seen the revised plan, I added in discussions with Aaron, and I totally agree, the addition of uh, erosion and sedimentation controls around pretty much the entire property line, because most of it is in the 100 foot buffer. There's a, there is a little bit outside the 100, but it's inconsequential. Uh, Excuse me, Mark. Sorry, Mark, two seconds. Could everyone else mute aside from Mark, please? Thanks, go ahead. So Ward, you know, I, I'm not, I was not part of the original uh, deline or any of the delineation, most of the history. Ward just got busy and he couldn't handle this. So he asked me to take it on. So I said, okay. So I've been working with Pete and Ward discussions and with Aaron 
to come up with this revised plan. Berkshire Design came up with the plan uh, in working with Pete. You see the, the rain garden. Now the rain garden's not taking the entirety of the runoff because the driveway on the south side doesn't flow to the north, to the rain garden. You can see the contours there. So Aaron asked if we would pitch the driveway so that the runoff would go to the north towards the wetland line. And uh, the plan doesn't show that, but part of the, uh, what, I, what Aaron and I discussed is, and I told Pete, is we'll get a revised plan, uh, you know, is that will be the plan of record. It will address uh, what you see on the current plan plus anything else that needs to be added to. So that's not a problem. Uh, is, you know, this was submitted after your bylaw update of what was it, beginning of this month, end of June. Uh, and uh, Pete can certainly discuss the, the discussions he's had with the commission and he's had with Ward on this site in general. Uh, you can see the wetland line. Did you do you have did you give them the colorized version, Aaron? Hold on a second. Yeah, so we we could see your like highlighted markup version. And it looks like Aaron's tracing the delineation line right now, the BBW line right now in red. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, thanks, Aaron. <laughs> um so yeah, again, most of the project is inside the buffer, um, but this is, you know, a great plan, very clear, um, very clear where the project uh, exists relative to our jurisdiction. Um, I don't know if we need to, Pete, unless you have something you want to add. I think, you know, this is kind of a, you know, a new application. I don't think we need to rehash how we got here, I do want to um, say thank you for this very organized application and working with Aaron to get everything we needed to get to this point in the meeting. And I want to keep this moving because I know that this has been a drawn out process. Um, Pete, do you have anything that you want to add at this point? Uh, the only thing, if it's the right time, Mark, we, we had talked about my uh, sharing a thought about uh, the one requirement to keep all water on the on the property. Is that still a concern, Aaron? Because uh, I mean, the problem with say, you know, there's water going to be coming down the driveway. Hopefully, most of it, most if not all, will be going to the north. But you still have that area off the property actually on Canton Ave that is vegetated that, that there's not much we can do there. So you, you will have a little, Pete said, uh, there was a ZBA hearing permit that required, what was it Pete, the first 12 feet to be paved with two foot gravel offshoot that we don't have control over and water, it, it, remember the, Canton Ave in the outline is not fully paved. Part of it's vegetated, part of it is paved. So that's why you see the, uh, the driveway actually paved all the way halfway through Canton Avenue. Mm. So we really have no control, not much control over that area there. So there will be a little water coming off, but during major storm events, you're going to get major water coming off anyway, regardless of whether or not it's developed or not developed. So I just, if I could just jump in here. So normally the process we follow, and I, I think um, it might be better for Jen to explain this, but usually we have a presentation for five minutes, mm -hmm. uh, comments from the public, comments from the commission, and then I weigh in with conditions. Okay. Once I go through my conditions, then we could start hashing out sort of okay. conditions here and there. Um, but I think Understood. just to keep things moving rather than jumping into the discussion sure. of conditions right now, that maybe okay. we should just keep going with that unless okay. yeah, but, otherwise. No, I think that's right. I, but 
um, point taken. I see what you're talking about there. Um, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, I yeah. mean, that's the basic. It's a pretty simple project. The, the, the primary issue is the driveway is only, you know, three or four feet from the actual wetland line around that 195, I think it is, contour. Yeah, yeah, see it. Um, okay, all right, well, um, I guess the next step would be to take any public comment or questions at this point, and then Aaron, maybe you can give us a download on your thoughts on um, potential conditions. Um, all right, so if you wouldn't, yeah, thanks for stopping sharing. Um, so if you are here and interested in making a comment or asking a question about the hearing for to Canton Ave, please raise your hand. And again, as a reminder, if you can introduce yourself and your address, um, how you're related to the project, and then ask, keep any questions or comments to two minutes or less and relevant to our jurisdiction on this project, I would appreciate it. Um, I see Benjamin Bailey. Sorry, everyone, it does, it takes a, an awkward amount of time for this to load. Okay, Benjamin, we see you. But... Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Um, yes, um, I'm, I'm, my name is Benjamin Bailey. I live at 165 North Whitney Street. Um, the proposed plan puts a house very close to the property line right behind my house. So the, this is a house that's not built on the street near sidewalks that kind of fits in with the character of the neighborhood. My substantive uh, issue for the committee though is that um, the, the wetlands guidelines require something like a 20 foot buffer between any construction work and uh, wetlands. This one is putting a permanent structure, the driveway within a few feet of the wetlands. So I guess I would like the, the committee to, to explain why this is being overridden in this case. What is it about this project that's so valuable or what mitigation or, you know, or in terms of the wetlands, why is that being overridden here? Okay, am I, can I talk? Is there somebody else there with you? Uh, actually, yes, actually, my wife is here. Yeah, hi. So I'm Julia Rushemeyer. I live at the same address, 165 North Whitney Street. So we, um, as abutters, I guess, we went through many of these hearings in the last couple of years. And the last that, and I haven't followed it since the end of the last time, but what happened last time is I went out and I, was this a year ago, a year and a half ago, and trees were just being cut down. And, and I'm sure you, you all are aware of what happened last time, that, that it was just the plan wasn't followed at all. And I, my understanding is the developers were being fined and they were had to mitigate the damage that they had already done, which is you can't really put trees back on. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to know, like, what has been mitigated? Ha, has all the damage already been mitigated? I mean, isn't that sort of the starting point? And, and I might have missed multiple hearings where that already happened and it's been fixed or addressed. Um, but my concern is what's gonna be different this time and what conditions, I guess the conditions are what you're gonna be discussing, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, great questions. Erin, uh, would you be willing to give a brief overview of kind of the enforcement and how that ended up? Um, this is a new application, so it's and definitely procedurally it's it stretched our know-how certainly um so yeah Aaron would you mind giving that brief overview yes so when I started with the town in um October of 2019 we had received a request to um extend the order of conditions uh, for another three years. So it was basically reaching its, its expiration date. And as I do with any um, permit, when it's coming up for expiration, I go out and have a look and see, have the resource area boundaries changed? Has any site conditions changed that would basically require that we not extend the permit and or that um, there be a new filing? And so when I went out to look at the site, I immediately saw that work had been done there in, in violation. Um, and I sort of backtracked and discovered that 
the property had been sold, um, that uh, the new owner had gone in to clear the lot. And in speaking with um, Pete and um, sort of, I guess, Wilson Construction, I'm not sure exactly who I spoke to back in 2019, but it came to my attention that they were unaware of the order of conditions and had gone in to do the clearing didn't realize that they needed to do a pre-construction meeting and installation of erosion controls. It, um, it was expressed that they didn't even know there was wetlands on the site. So there was an enforcement order issued. Um, we went through a lengthy process with the enforcement order close to a year um, to basically determine that it was in fact a wetland that had been cleared and excavated. Um, there was some argument that it wasn't the wetland that was cleared, but we determined that it was in fact that it was in fact the wetland that was cleared. Um, and as a result, there was a restoration plan and we required that they go back in and redelineate because when we went out to check the plantings for the restoration plan, it was clear that the wetland had expanded. And again, a lot of times when you cut down trees in a wetland, the thought is, oh, it'll dry the wetland up, but in reality, it makes the wetland more wet. So the wetland expanded pretty significantly. And that presented us with the challenge of how do we deal with this? Because ordinarily, if the site conditions change, it automatically triggers a new filing. Um, we asked um, Pete to put together a, a revised plan that took into consideration the new wetland boundary, which he did. and. Um, uh, we had that new plan before us and around that same time the permit came up for expiration again. Um, when we were reviewing the permit that was extended and sort of trying to figure out how to deal with this um, revised plan relative to one of the lots in the subdivision, um, it was discovered or determined that the wetland boundaries had changed on the other lot as well. And so we then had changed wetland boundaries on two of the lots in the subdivision. And so at that point, we basically asked Pete Wilson to resubmit um, and just let the old order of conditions die, so to speak. Um, so we would close out the old order of conditions, call it invalid, and start fresh with a new permit. In doing that, though, there is a certain expectation that the commission previously issued um, approval of building lots, buildable lots on these two sites. And so there's a good faith effort on behalf of, you know, Mr. Wilson to resubmit an application with the expectation that now he can he can still be able to build his house there. So that is why there are some sort of procedural differences with this particular application and also the setback that for the driveway was previously approved. And so I think that there's a little bit of sort of discretion that needs to be made by the board to consider this application. Yeah, Benjamin, I think you're muted still. Um, right. So I, I guess I would like to, so, so there's some precedent here and you're respecting the precedent that essentially the same driveway was approved before, even though the driveway was not conforming with wetland requirements. So I, I think it's worth hearing from you all why you would want to approve it now. It's quite clear that they're building permanent structures within a zone that's normally not even allowed to do construction of any kind. So we can permit this inside the buffer to the resource. Um, so this is something that we are allowed to permit. And that's why we talk about heavily conditioning the project. Um, and that's the discussion that we're about to get into um, is like really, really, really detailed. Um, yeah, I don't know what another word aside from condition. Um, parameters that we apply, borders um, that we apply to how this project works, both during the building phase and the finished project. Um, so I'd encourage you to stay on for that. Um, and also maybe after public comment commissioners, um, we will open this up for discussion and um, I'll give commissioners a chance to kind of weigh in on this as well. Um, unless anyone, commissioners, does anyone have an immediate response? that they'd like to 
make this plane. Okay. Yeah, so we're gonna keep this, um, we just have to keep this here moving, Benjamin, but if you have further questions after um, we talk, we can we can come back to that at that point. This, this is a, a very separate question. If I okay. May. Um, the Wilson seem like amiable people when we approached them uh, in this wetlands area a year or two ago. They had no clue of where any property boundaries were. They had no clue where any wetlands were. They couldn't point to any pins. They were moving heavy equipment around. They had a couple of laborers just cutting stuff down. When this plan was designed originally by Bucky Sprinkle, I think it was exquisitely done with a computer down to the foot, nice drawings. Um, given the Wilson's tradition, uh, uh, past history dear, here, do you all consider where the, whether they're capable of doing such careful work here when before they couldn't even find pins, weren't even aware of any of this? Um, well, and, and actually, just one more thing. When I told them they were in violation, they said, oh, we're, I mean, they weren't worried about it. They didn't care. They knew that they were cutting down in violation of a plan. Yeah, I was so out there at the same time. Yeah, I hear your concern. Um, we've yeah. had quite the journey since that point, so I don't want to speak for the Wilsons, but I think they're very well aware now of the very, very tight um, elbow room on this site. Um, I also this the screen that um, Aaron was sharing earlier is also a very well engineered plan. So it is the same level of plan that Bucky Sparkle would have submitted for the original NOI. Um, and the last thing I'll say is again, please stay on and listen to the conditions that we put on this permit because we can do a lot in terms of making sure that there's oversight um, and reporting and supervision during the construction process. Um, so it is unlikely we'll be in a situation again where there's heavy equipment out there in close proximity to the resource and there's not someone watching and reporting to the commission about it. Um, Michelle, did you have a comment? You're, mute. You're muted. I can wait. Okay. Okay, thank you both um, for being here and I would encourage you to stay on for the rest of the discussion because I think we'll be able to address some of these concerns. Okay, Mary Anderson. <clears throat> we can see you, Mary. It looks like you're muted. <laughs> okay, I'm old, what can I say? Um, yeah, so my family's had this property north of there since 1949. So there you go, that explains part of it right there. Uh, so I have a couple questions. First of all, at the risk of sounding stupid, the point of the buffer, you, you keep referring to the buffer. It looked to me like the buffer was like a raised area intended to hold back water inside of which the house would sit. So am I misreading the diagram? So a buffer is just a known distance from a delineation. Okay. Um, so so all those it's literally little, little, like an equal measurement. If you move, so say your wetland is a circle, your uh -huh. hundred foot buffer would be a hundred foot radius around okay. that circle. Um, okay. So it's literally like a known distance from the resource to that buffer delineation. Thank you, thank you. So all those little squiggly lines, those were not elevation lines, like looking like a, you know, as I looked at it, they looked like a hill. Those there squiggly. are also elevation lines on there. Okay. <laughs> um, there's there's graded there's the grading is captured on that plan and also actual resource delineation and then various buffer widths from that resource. Okay. So there's a, there's a lot happening on that plan. Um, I mean, the ones that look like a hill are probably topo topographic lines. Yeah. So like you were looking at the driveway, probably. I was looking the, north of the driveway. I guess that's north uh, to where the house would be. And okay. the, on the right, as you look at it on the right hand side with those squiggly lines kind of curving around. But so, but I was wondering, we keep talking about all the water. Well, it seems to me if there are already water problems and stuff and you're going to put a fixed structure 
with footings and so on going, you know, however deep they go, you're in effect creating a dam. And I, I couldn't tell, I, I guess all of these other things you're talking about for water flow is going to be sufficient for whatever this invented dam now is holding back. Does that make sense? Because that's how it looks to me. But again, I couldn't read the lines either. So maybe, maybe it's just me. Yeah. But it's a thought. Because yeah. that's how it sounds. You know, you're talking about, and then talking about the water along the driveway, I guess going left to right, and that's going to be banked. So the water stays on the property because it, I heard someone say of the requirement to keep the water on the property. But what about the water that comes from the house down the driveway toward Camden Avenue? Is that going to be extra highly banked or, you know, like things yeah. like that? Yeah, so you can see, okay, thanks, Aaron. You read my mind. Um, so let's talk about, can oh, you yeah, see this? You. Can you see this plan, Mary? Yes, that's so, right. So, yeah, so the, let's, how do I start here? Okay, so the green line okay. is, is a sediment and erosion control. That is hard for me to see. It's almost exactly, if you're looking along the driveway, just above the driveway, you can mm -hmm. see the green line. And then there's like a dash dot dot line. Right. That's the actual resource delineation. Um, so that, if, that, that's where the wetlands are? Yep. And then kind of fit in gray faded behind that perpendicular to that delineation line, you can see a dashed, like kind yep. of very light gray line. Yes, that's yeah. the existing topographic, like the existing topographic situation at the site. Okay. And then the solid lines are how the project grading will change that grading on the site. So where you see solid lines with numbers in the middle over the driveway, those yeah. are actual elevation numbers and what the finished grading will be at the site. So there's a lot happening here, but basically to address your, sorry, Aaron, let me just finish my one thought. Um, the other thing to note is that there's this rain garden in the middle of this proposed project. So if you look at where Aaron just highlighted in red over the wetland delineation and go directly above that, it's what looks like if you look at the proposed grading, essentially a hole, she's circling it now in pink, that's mm -hmm. a rain garden. And the job of that rain garden is to basically absorb and encourage infiltration of water that drains off of the structure um, so that the water, any water <laughs> that lands on this property stays on this property. Um, right. So your and dam does that doesn't quite fit. There is like a impervious, like we're increasing the impervious surface here. And so that's why um, the applicant has done so much work to make sure that any water that falls on what is now impervious um, is maintained on the on the site itself. I see. Okay. Okay. Sarah, well, did you have an addendum to that? Yeah, I just wanted to point out a couple quick things on this plan. Um, so, on the original plan, prior to Mark marking it up with colors. This line right here, which I'm following with orange, um, okay, is noted on the plan. Um, let me see if I can find the call out for it. Erosion control barrier or organic filter berm. Now, I raised a concern about that, and I'll get into my conditions later, but I raised a concern about that berm. Um, because okay so for a variety of reasons so i'm just going to i'm just going to choose a different color here to make this easier um in speaking with mark the rain garden is not created to capture all the water on this site it's only basically created to capture the water that's within the elevations above it so anything that's elevation above that rain garden that is going to flow towards that rain garden but the elevations um, that are below the rain garden, the water is going to move this way. Okay, that was why I had asked for a um, the the driveway to be pitched to the north, so water could move in this direction uh, north, and basically that this that berm is not a berm. 
it's no that can't be a berm because right? the water has to be able to move in that northerly direction into the lot as opposed to moving off the lot in this direction. Um, so that's why that revision was made. The other revision that I asked for was adding a berm here. And the reason for that is because there have been reports of water moving off the site in this direction. And so the idea of the berm is to water, water is, is from all the impervious areas moving to the center of the site. And then when that water reaches capacity that this berm would essentially slow the water from moving down into the roadway. Um, so that's why those design changes were made. We haven't gotten into the conditions yet, but that's why I had made those recommendations on the change. So I just wanted to point those out. Okay. And, and do all of your, all your calculations must also take into account the accumulation of water coming off the hill above. So if it's a heavy rainfall, heavy enough to be managed by the, the berms and the whatever you were just describing, and, and the impervious, the runoff from the impervious structure. But in addition, there's going to be exponentially more water coming from above. That's the water that I think we're most concerned about because that's going to overrun it. It's already overrunning things. I don't know if Mrs. Hart is here, but uh, she had to have the fire department come. She owns a house on the corner of Canton. I'll let her speak if she's here. Uh, but she had to have the fire department come and pump out her cellar. It was almost knee deep. That was this past spring. And that has happened many, many times. And she's owned the house since the early 50s. And there's a whole story that, you know, was probably more appropriate from her. But the bottom line is recently she's had major water problems. So it's all well and good on a, a one dimensional paper to say, oh, the water will go here, there, and everywhere. And when it rains, it can absorb X number of inch fall. But in this particular case, you must also consider the additional rainfall. Anything that's additional here is going to be very additional coming down the hill above it. And we already have evidence of that. Also, when you mentioned uh, the extra little thing you put at the end of the driveway up there because you heard a runoff, that was the, one of the original streams. There's a stream that runs through there. And it's just about where you were saying that you asked them to put something extra. So thank you for coming up with the ideas to, to do those kinds of things. But I just think this is going to be a nightmare for, and for the residents to buy it. It's not gonna be a happy place for them either. There is too much water too frequently in that area. But I'm sorry, I've taken a lot of no, your time. No, no, don't apologize. Listen. Thank you, Mary. A lot, of our, a lot of our best information comes from conversations like this. So definite, I don't want to diminish that kind of information. And I see that is it maybe Joan Hart? I can see that she's here. So oh good. Uh, oh good. Thank you. Her, she raises her hand. Um Miss Hart, if you raise your hand, I can give you permission to talk. But we appreciate you being here, Mary. Um and I encourage you to to stay for this the remainder of this hearing. Oh um, I will. We'll get into the details. Okay. okay. I'm in Thank California, you. so I have all night. <laughs> Man, I'm jealous. I'm tired. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, so then, um, Joan, I see you raised your hand. Freddie has had their hand up for a long time. So we're going to promote Freddie to a panelist. And again, just a reminder, if there's any way, um, just so we can keep our meeting moving, if we can keep these comments and questions to a limited amount of time, I would really appreciate it. Trying to move, move through this. Freddie should be on their way in. I don't know what's happening here. Ready, we can see that you're there. Oh. I'm slow to move, I guess, yeah. There you go, no, <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> it's always really slow. Um, thank you, sorry about that. If you wouldn't mind okay. introducing yourself. I, I can just be a, a name on the, on the billboard. Uh, my name is Freddie Munger. I'm at 187 North Whitney Street and have been since 1976 in this location. 
And I would like to compliment both Pete and Mark for the exquisite detail and their attention to all of the concerns that had been raised, or many of the concerns that had been raised about the, the past plan. And I, it's really clear, and I can see how you're really trying to manage all of the contingencies that are, that are currently affecting this property. Um, I'm gonna deviate a bit and look a tiny bit ahead. And I'm wondering where in future, when the other lot is developed in two or three more houses, go up, where are you gonna put the cul-de-sac that will be necessary for fire trucks and school buses to turn around? Um, every place I look seems to be very fragile wetland. So I'm just wondering where, um, first of all, why there isn't a requirement for a cul-de-sac at the moment. And then in future, how you see this, this looks like a segmented plan to me. And this is like the first stage in something that will go on. And how can we anticipate with this plan, the needs for a further development in future to accommodate uh, fire trucks and, and school buses that will need to turn around as the, there are more houses built up in that area. Freddie, I appreciate the, the forward thinking um, nature of your questions in, in a disappointing way. Unfortunately, what we're able to consider is the application we have in front of us and as it pertains to kind of our jurisdiction, which is the Wetland Protection Act and the Wetland Bylaws for the town of Amherst. So not only can we not really consider things like a cul-de-sac and, and access, we also like aren't really equipped to do that. Um, I will give Mark Stinson, if you would like to make any comments about this, I feel like I should give you an opportunity, but um, otherwise, if you would be willing to just comment on when this would be going, this application would be going to like the zoning board or the planning board so that Freddie could follow that the application in other um, commissions that that would be jurisdictional. I would appreciate it. Pete Wilson is, uh, he got kicked off for some reason. Uh, or he lost his connection, he's back on, he'd be better able to explain anything for the future. But as I understand it, there's nothing planned for any additional house or lots at this time. Not to say there won't be, but at this time, there's nothing planned. Okay, thanks, Mark. Yeah, um, I think I just brought Pete back into the meeting. Pete, I can see her there, but I see that you're muted. I don't know if you were able to hear Freddie's question, if you wanted to make any comments. Uh, thanks, yeah, last time I was talking, the the internet must have stopped on our end because it uh, we lost connection. No, Mark, Mark said it exactly as I've explained it to him. Uh, there is nothing at this time. We're gonna work on this particular lot uh, and that's why we're here tonight. Okay. So Freddie, I'm sorry that's disappointing, but um, if there is any application submitted, so Pete, can you can you comment on any applications with the zoning board or planning board for this property? Uh, for this property, we will be going before the zoning board to change the ownership. I believe there's a requirement for that, but we're going to wait till we're through uh, with your board before okay. doing that. That okay. will happen probably later this summer or early fall. Okay, so Freddie, so abutters would be notified, but Freddie, I don't know if you're an immediate abutter, but you should keep an eye on agendas for the zoning board. Um, and that would be a good place to ask your question. Hey, I think, well, thank you very much for, for that. And I will certainly do that. But my question did pertain to where, since everything around there is wet, uh, where such a where such a structure could go, and you know it's always sometimes I think we it's good to think about the big picture when you're looking at the little picture. So that would be a concern of anybody, and there is really no place to put it. So. Okay, with that, thank you. I'll mute myself. Thank you for being here. Appreciate we appreciate it. All right. Um, Again, please raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question. I see Joan Hart. I'm going to promote you to panelist.
Joan, we can see that you're part of the meeting now, but we can't hear you. You might be muted, which you would change by in the very bottom left of this application screen, you would press that microphone. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Joan Hart and I own the property at 40 Canton Avenue. That's the last house on the street and the, the driveway looks like it's gonna be pouring more water into my cellar. As it is now, every time I get a small shower or anything else, there's water in the cellar. And um, you know, I've had at one time, a year ago, I had had fire department come and, and pump it out because it gotten up to two and a half feet. Uh, and it's a problem all the time. And it looks like it's not going to change at all. So that's my concern. You know, what happens when I can't sell the house because I wouldn't ever not tell any particular person that wanted the house that it wasn't a, a real problem with the house. So it's really making the the house less valuable, and uh, it's just been kind of a nightmare for me. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. That has been a real hard time for us with the water. We appreciate that and you being here, Joan. Erin, did you have a comment? I have a question for Joan. Joan, um, the water that you're getting in your basement do you have a sense of what the source of that water is? What I mean by that is, is the water sort of infiltrating into your house from the floor of the basement up like groundwater? Or is there water coming in a channel formation down into a window or something that is pouring into your house? Well, I can only tell you what the fireman asked me when he was out down there pumping the water. He said, where is this coming from? I said, well, we got wetlands in the back and I've never had it before at this um, stage of my life. And I said, uh, now it's completely changed. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. That, that, uh, so I don't know what else to say about it. Okay. But I just thought I just thought it was something that you know the conservation people should consider. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. All right. Um, if you are here for the NOI hearing for Two Canton Ave and you have a question or a comment, please raise your hand. Gaston, promoting you to panelist. Thank you so much. Let me get some lights here. Um, I uh, am the neighbor across the street, and I. Uh, Gaston, you're you're you keep freezing. Um, is there any way to try turning off the video? The history of development didn't proceed exactly. Uh, the concern about wetland. Gaston, we're having a really hard time hearing you. Um, it's like re your audio is really choppy and your video is frozen. Could you try turning off your video maybe? Uh, is the, um, is just for the, in, in a text to, uh, Gaston, we really, we can't hear you or understand what you're saying. I'm sorry, um, I got disconnected. What I want to say, my, my main concern is that uh, we're all, that the desire way that any we did seem to have a uh, flowing of water 
Gaston, speak. we really, we can't uh, hear you. Uh, like, seem to be room. new. Uh, this was a year and a half ago. And um, Gaston, I'm not sure what to do about this. We really can't hear you. Um, if you wouldn't mind writing your comments and emailing it to, to Erin, um, you can find her email address on the website. That way we can enter it into public record. Right sure. now, we, thank you. We can't hear you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, should I have handled that differently? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, last call. Any comments or questions about the hearing for two Canton Ave? Please raise your hand. Okay. Um. All right, so I feel like there is kind of an, an outstanding question that became clear from a butters just there, particularly um, Benjamin Bailey's early comment that I just wanna make sure we address. Um, so Aaron, do you wanna go through your suggested conditions? And let's just like get into the nitty gritty on that. And we come out the other side, I want to make sure commissioners weigh in on kind of permittability and if we've done everything we can to protect their resource with the conditions that Aaron's proposed. Um, because I think that the abettors had great comments and I wanna make sure that we're weighing those heavily um, in, in how we move forward with this application. Unless Michelle, did you wanna, I know you were holding on a comment. Do you wanna wait until after the conditions or make a comment now? I was gonna um, relay something that I talked to Aaron with privately before the meeting. I don't know, Aaron, if he's just, I wait after. Yeah, I mean, I can, I, are you talking about the taking thing? Yeah, so since the commission issued a permit to develop this lot and very recently um, the permit for the subdivision expired, what Michelle and I were talking about was like, could the commission deny it? Could the commission deny putting house there? And my recommendation was not to. And the reason for that is because if you say somebody can build some, somewhere and then turn around and say, no, you can't, then they may have um, uh, ammunition for a lawsuit for a taking of land, like that it was developable and is no longer developable. Um, so that's what we were talking about offline was just that the, the complexity of this case relative to that. And so I think that's what Michelle was wanting me to mention. Yeah, I was going to mention it relative to the first comment we had, but that's that's what I wanted to add off the bat. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Michelle. Um, okay, Aaron, should we jump yeah. into these conditions? Yeah, I'm going to jump in, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to address everything that I can holistically, and then you guys can just take it from there as far as discussion goes. Um, <clears throat> so... My outstanding questions, and I don't want Mark to jump into this right now, I want to run through everything, but the outstanding questions were planting and stabilization of the rain garden. And then Mark had mentioned at the sort of kickoff of this that there was a ZBA requirement for stone drainage along the driveway edges. And I just wanted to make sure that I point out um, that if there are any formal revisions made to this plan, that any revisions that were approved as part of another board or committee's review process and approval process that those need to be incorporated on here. So for example, and I'll just throw this out there now, if there was limitations on the driveway length and the driveway is now longer than it was previously, those are things that are going to affect your approval when you go back before ZBA. Um, if the, there was drainage incorporated along the driveway that's no longer there, then the ZBA is going to have a problem with that. So you may want to consider having a look at what was approved by the ZBA and those requirements and making sure that those um, revisions were incorporated. Just wanted to state those two things because those were two outstanding issues. So I was going through this from the standpoint of recommended conditions um, that we could in part on the permit to keep this under as sort of strict of control as possible. And part of that is just because 
we don't always have the owner doesn't always have control over the contractors working on the site and we already had a history of of that occurring here so to in an effort to try to keep things as buttoned up as possible so state and local boilerplate conditions um, permanent demarcation of the limit of work with boulders and that could be another type of marker it could be signage it could be a split rail fence it could be um, rebar markers something to indicate that there's a limit of work that can't be crossed um, and that in a condition. Uh, standard pre-construction meeting and erosion control inspection with the wetlands administrator. No future alteration of the wetlands on this lot um, is permitted and that's a requirement in perpetuity um, and that would be an ongoing condition in the certificate of compliance. No vegetation removal permitted outside of the limit of work line. Uh, site monitoring by a third party competent um, professional wetland scientist during the construction phase from groundbreaking to final stabilization. Um, inspections, including photos um, of the entire site, including erosion control boundary and recommendations for maintenance and repair. Um, and again, those can be in an informal email format. Site runoff may not be directed toward the roadway or neighboring properties. All runoff from the site shall be directed toward the rain garden. If the runoff is documented coming off this property after construction, it will be considered out of compliance with the order of conditions. There was an argument or sort of discussion going on offline as to our jurisdiction on that. And I just wanted to point out in our bylaw that we do have a requirement that proposed plans that propose directing drainage toward neighboring properties not subject to the application will not be accepted all proposed drainage discharges stormwater features must be captured treated and infiltrated on the property subject to the application that is the reason for that condition um the water needs to stay on this site and dealt with on this site infiltrated on this site um, the entire lot is within the buffer only native plantings may be used on the site including landscaping Erosion must uh, encircle the entire work area. As you could see previously, there was like a organic um, berm that was proposed and it and or erosion controls. It's got to be erosion controls and I'd like to see uh, straw bales with a um, construction fence circling the entire site to make it extremely clear that there are property boundaries tight on two sides of the lot and a wetland that's tight on the other side. So it's clear that those are boundaries which are not to be um, crossed over. Um, I recommended in the conditions a 30 foot stone construction entrance be installed at the driveway apron with three to four inch rip wrap to be used as a tracking pad to prevent sediment from being tracked from the driveway onto the roadway during construction. Um, snow may not be stored or pushed into the wetlands or buffer zone on the east side of the property or the rain garden that snow storage must be in the gravel turnaround only or taken off site. And that grading should direct snow melt toward the rain garden. Um, prior to the start of work, revised plan shall be submitted to the Conservation Commission, which incorporates notes for all applicable special conditions, erosion controls, construction fencing, snow storage area boulders. Conservation administrators shall sign off on the order of conditions, which serves as an acknowledgement of the rot. revised updated plan being submitted um, with the requirements prior to the start of work. The revised plan shall include uh, native plantings, the proposed proposed in the rain garden and the operation and maintenance plan for the rain garden which were not included in this um, application um, and that the maintenance requirements should comply with the DEP um, B, BMP manual. The filter berm um, that was proposed around the driveway my concern was that that was going to serve basically as a means for water to not go to the site for it to go off site and so I think that filter berm needs to be altogether removed um, and that that should not be used in lieu of erosion controls. I think I covered everything. That was very thorough. I am not able to think of anything to add, um, but <laughs> give me a few minutes. Um, commissioners, any questions, additions, comments? Michelle. Um, so we're putting uh, this rain garden is going to take a lot of responsibility for the water on this site. And I was um, interested as what what's the plan capacity for it? Like, what is the total impervious surface that's being added to the site? 
And based on uh, comments from abutters about stream flow and some flooding, I guess I have some concerns that this rain garden, I mean, is it, does it have the capacity to hold all of the water from this entire site because it's basically functioning as the entire stormwater system? Mark, do you want to take a crack at that one? Okay. Uh oh, I think we have an audio problem. Mark's muted. Yeah, he. I think he's having trouble getting unmuted. Is my guess. <laughs> um, okay, Pete. I don't know if can you hear us or comment. Do you? Are you able to answer Michelle's question? Yeah, I mean, we had the engineer from Berkshire Design Group go over that. Uh, so I don't know the criteria he applied offhand. But that is something that Mark or I can check with and we can get you the details as to the size and why it's that size. The, the other thing, just in general, uh, while we're on this subject, and again, no disrespect uh, intended towards the, uh, the neighbors and so forth, but it is hard for me, like with Mrs. Hart, uh, I don't know where her home is exactly in relation to this particular lot. So it is a little bit ambiguous. Um, and it's, you know, it's the first thing we've ever heard of. Um, so I just raised that question. The other thing I'd like to clarify is with this lot, the Western edge of the property, there are neighbors who have, you know, long yards and yes, there is water that probably flows towards our property uh, along that west line but it sheet flows not only towards our property but all those yards um, which uh, which back up to ours on that western edge it would be their eastern edge our western edge that their slopes also run south so as water is coming from a rainstorm off their lawns it's not only just coming at us it's also migrating south and the other question I or the other uh, thought I wanted to share is with Mary's comment she owns the land to the north and if you've been out there on the whole parcel um, this particular smaller lot there's a swale just to the north of where the house is there's a swale that runs beyond and into the larger piece um, and that swale carries water away from this smaller lot, you know, down through. Um, so I think she was saying water coming from her property south would go into this swale and would never even get to this, the smaller lot. So I just wanted to, you know, share those couple thoughts. Thanks. Yeah, it's a it's a complicated system for sure. Um, I actually so try to answer Michelle's uh, question, um, Aaron or Jen. Um, when we when we did this back in 2017, Bucky Sparkles put it all in there. Bucky showed us the the reason for how big the rain garden is going to be. Um, obviously, because of the impervious surface and the roof drainage and how that all is going to fall into the rain garden. Has any of that changed? No. I new I was just, oh, what, what, what second, P? I was just trying to ask Aaron real quick. Um, because that, is, would that help answer? Um, Aaron, do you know if it's changed? Well, so the, the plan design did change slightly and I am not the designer, so it's difficult for me to assess like the carrying capacity as far as water volume from the previous approved plan to the current plan. But what I would say that might alleviate Michelle's concern about the water would be to have the plan stamped by the engineer that designed it. And right now the plan is not stamped. So that might alleviate some of the concern um, to have an engineer stamp asserting that it was designed properly. 
I think it's probably also something that the engineer that did the plan has their stormwater calcs and they can share those. Um, so in addition to the revisions to the plan, Erin, that you have conditioned, we could add, you know, please provide stormwater calcs for review by conservation agent prior to issuing a permit. Um, because the, the grading is based on something, right? So they've done it the way they've done it for some amount of storm, like a one inch storm, inch and a half storm. So they, they have some capacity that they've designed that rain garden around and it's just, we need to know what those numbers are. Mark, unless, you know, unless you know them off the top of your head. No, I don't, no. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Michelle. Oh, um, right, and so some recent changes would be that now the driveway is gonna be sloped to filter more water into the rain garden um, and there's, I don't know if, if this was designed after the additional wetlands were discovered, but in any case, there have been some changes to the direction of the water and there might be more pressure on that rain garden. So yeah, I would appreciate um, Aaron's suggestion. Well, I can talk to Chris Chamberlain of, uh, or Pete Will of Berkshire Design, who did the, did the plan, make sure we get you the information, absolutely. I mean, that's a good question. Great, thank you. Um, okay, commissioners, any other questions, comments, concerns? One more. Um, there is a condition about permanent uh, markings and we, we didn't really decide exactly what they'd be, but um, I'd like to see boulders to make this um, I just think, you know, wood, wood fences rot and can get knocked over by cars and snow plows. Um, rebar is hard to see. Um, PVC is not great to look at. So um, boulders are pretty obvious for, you know, if we're trying to make this run in perpetuity, that would be my request for the approval. Great. If I may. Yeah. Uh the primary problem I see with the boulders is, is along the driveway. And, you know, if you put boulders there, you're not going to be able to have that two foot gravel offset from the pavement. And, and if you do, uh, the boulders are going to be in the wet, sitting in the weather. Yeah. So, so I propose, you know, some uh, lolly column or PVC pipe and then just signage. I sent Erin some examples that that she can decide what's what's best. It basically says protected area. Where's that effect? I mean, the other the rest of the site. I don't know how much ledge or boulders are on the site. I mean, we prefer uh, something less obtrusive than big boulders, and that can I think that can be accomplished by you know four inch. Uh, uh, PVC pipe, I mean, that's not going to rot three feet down, two feet up. Or, you know, yeah, something like that. Uh, but along the driveway, it's just not feasible to put boulders there. Michelle, is that a reasonable compromise? I mean, that's pretty visible signage. Um, yeah, that signage is good. Um, I mean, I, I've only seen a couple of these situations before, so I don't know if commissioners have more experience with seeing how that uh, you know, ages, but I liked the look of the sign. Yeah. It's educational and makes the point. Yeah, yeah, I think it would achieve the goal. And in my experience, like what we end up going for demarcation really runs the gamut. Um, depending on site condition, then this is no different. Um, I agree, randomly having giant boulders in a site that's a lowland wetland area is kind of strange <laughs> anyway. So this might, you know, serve to actually do a better job at what we're trying to achieve. Erin, do you have any wisdom or strong feelings? Yeah, no, I think, I think along the driveway makes sense to do something else. Um, uh, because of the proximity to the wetland, which is a very unusual proximity that the commission would allow that level of encroachment. And so I think something else might be good in that section. Yeah. So, oh, I haven't seen the um, planting plan. Is there planting, Mark, is there planting plans on that part of the driveway that we're talking about with the gravel setback? 
No, that, uh, that goes. I right mean, that one. there's so little room. Right, I know. I'm not sure you're going to be able to have anything come in besides grass. Yeah, I know. I was thinking like shrubs or something. But and then it's going to these eventually come onto the driveway. No, I know it's tight. All right, but we're open to suggestions elsewhere. You know, especially the south side of the driveway. I'm not sure what you guys want. And you, you caught that because we're in the buffer, according to our bylaws, we've got to go with natives. Oh, absolutely. Anything. But I didn't know if you want native shrubs or grass or combination. I'm not sure what you were looking for. I think it's going to be hard to get. I mean, it's wet. You know, I don't know but, if a grass would even be happy. Like it might be more of like a hydric, you know, like a witch hazel elderberry kind of situation than a. Okay. Do you want to specify? You want to specify that? That's fine. A question. Hydric native wetland shrubs. Yeah. On the uh, the berm, Aaron, at the beginning of the driveway that heads north to keep the water from going on to Canton, do you have a specific what you're looking for? I mean, I thought something six inches up should divert the water. Is that something you think of? Um, I, as far as a design or specification, well, I would, just something yeah. like that, you know, just yeah. small berm. Yeah. Doesn't I'm, need to be big. I, yeah. I'm not looking to, to build, build something that's going to hold back a moat or something like that. <laughs> More so something that's going to just slow the water down as it's moving towards the road. Okay. That's fine. And I think that the incorporation of the stone on either side of the driveway, which we have done previously in Riverfront area on another site, which was very steep and actually has been working really well. Um, so the incorporation of stone on either side of the driveway, I think could further assist with infiltration along the driveway and capturing some of that um, runoff from the impervious. You're thinking of Shoot Spray Road, Aaron? Uh, East Leverett. Um, oh, I meant East Leverett. Yeah, I know you were thinking of the same site. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. A, the wrong road. You're thinking Cushman Brook because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. right across the street. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, gravel, anything to help infiltrate there. I mean, fortunately, you don't have to worry about a septic, you know, because who knows what, you, what depth of groundwater you hit there. Pretty close. Um, hey, I don't know if Pete has anything he wants to add. Let me um, mark commissioners. Does anyone have any other comments or questions about the order of conditions? Okay. Okay, yeah, we're, so we're going on an hour and 15 minutes on this hearing. So I think it's, it's about time to take the next step. Pete, did you have any questions or comments about the order of conditions that Aaron proposed and as we've discussed? No, um, Mark and I had gone over that uh, earlier today. Thank you. Okay, great. Aaron, question? So just with the volume of revision and also some of the information that the commission has requested in terms of um, confirming the capacity, volume capacity of the, the rain garden. I feel like we've got a really good framework for the order of conditions and I think we're getting really close, but I just wondered if we should wait to get yeah. a revised. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I, I just wasn't sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think we should continue the hearing. I don't want to, the reason I don't want to close the public hearing, Mark and Pete, is because it just puts us in a tough situation if we get to a point where we're not happy with any of the revisions. We don't have any vehicle to, again, revise the order of conditions. So if it's okay with you, we're really close. I would like to continue the hearing to the August 10 meeting. And by then, if it's, if it's feasible on your end, if we have these revisions, primarily the stormwater calcs are probably like the heaviest lift, um, then we can um, move forward at that meeting as expediently as possible. Um, is that okay on your end, Mark? And Pete, I would recommend you, you agree to the extension, to the uh, hearing extension. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, okay. So with this, commissioners, I think we're looking for a motion to continue the 
to Canton Ave hearing to August 10th. You know what time, Erin? Yeah, bear with me for just one moment. Um, I know we're stacking. 7.50? Yeah. I think it's our fifth hearing already scheduled for that meeting. We'll try to make it quick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, again, I appreciate the detail on these plans and the work to get to this point. And I think we're, we're really close, but um, I think that's a legitimate, it's a legitimate due diligence to go over those stonewater calcs. So I appreciate oh, the cooperation. All right, thank you. Good seeing you all. And we'll see you yeah. again on the 10th. And if I, I have any questions, I'll just shoot Aaron a call. Give Aaron okay. a call. Great, thank, thank you, you Aaron. and Pete. Um, commissioners, I need a, a motion. I move, a motion. To con no? Go ahead. I move to continue the public hearing on um, 2 Canton Avenue to August 10th, uh, 2022 at 7.50 p.m. Second. Fletcher on the second, voice vote, Andre. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Larry. Aye. I'm also an aye. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Good night. Good night. All right. That one was always going to be complex. Um, thanks for the attention to detail, everyone. Um, so next hearing I know is SWCA on behalf of Ron Laverdier for construction of a multifamily residential building and associated site work and mitigation in the riverfront and buffer zone to BVW at 395 West Street. This is a continuation. Um, I know if you can read if you're in attendance and you want to represent this application, if you could raise your hand, I'm assuming Mickey Marcus. Um, and Ken Hoffman. Hi, Mickey, we can see you. Okay. Um, so uh, we last met on um, June 22nd and um, Commission had some suggestions and recommendations. Um, we were able to make all those changes in the plan and those were submitted to the commission uh, two weeks ago. Uh, also, uh, since the last hearing, we did receive um, a letter from Natural Heritage. They did not require any plan changes. Um, they did ask for one condition that the commission include in the orders and that's that uh, no work is allowed to take place until a turtle protection plan is uh, prepared and approved by natural heritage. Uh, and so th that we have a turtle biologist actually working on that plan and that'll get submitted to heritage. And once they approve that, we'll, uh, we'll give the commission a copy of that. Um, we, uh, so we added a, a note to plan sheet number three, requiring that the turtle protection plans required. Uh, we did add a uh, raised uh, wooden footbridge uh, across um, an area that's currently a paved driveway, but we're going to restore that as a wetland. And uh, we've shown that as an ADA compliant footbridge. Uh, we did show a location the commission suggested for educational signage. Uh, next to West Street, we showed the location of that, and um, we don't have a, a design for that educational signage, so we expect that we would have the commission uh, review and approve that before it's installed. Um, and we did include a note on the plan. Uh, we talked about some dead and dying trees along the current driveway that's to be removed, and it, there are several white pine trees that are dead and uh, Norway spruce that are dead or dying. Um, and what else? Uh, uh, one of the commission members, I'm sorry, I can't recall, who uh, requested some information about the invasive species control and how that would 
be taking place. And so <clears throat> I provided details of um, how that work would be done. And basically the, the invasive shrubs would be hand cut and a wick application of an herbicide. And um, there's a glove wipe method that I've uh, incorporated. And then uh, if we're gonna treat the Phragmites that are in the wetlands, that would be done by spray. Um, but I think, I think I included in the site plans all the information that the commission previously asked for. Uh, I will say that um, Aaron did ask for some riverfront area calculations and some other calculations I was not able to provide to her. This is information that's required in the DEP order condition form. Um, I can get that to her, but all my CAD people are either on vacation or out of town. So I don't have the, the numbers that everyone asked for. So I apologize for that, but I couldn't get that prior to this hearing tonight. So um, if you decide to close the hearing, uh, I'll, I'll get Aaron that information prior to the issuance of an order of condition, but uh, I, I don't have those riverfront area calculations tonight. Okay, yeah, thanks, Mickey. I think just to manage expectations based on the nature of like how necessary those calcs are for the actual form. Um, we can't close the public hearing. We'll have to continue because otherwise, if there's some discrepancy or something isn't clear after we've closed the hearing, we don't have an avenue to correct it in the conditions. Um, so we'll have to continue the hearing. Um, I think, Aaron, did you have another like, is there like a clerical situation that we wanted to clear up about? I, so it might make sense to just go through so far, like comments and everything. If we're going to continue anyway, that way we can take care of everything and hopefully okay. be prepared to just close an issue at the next meeting. Um, okay. And I'll just pull that up and I'll run through similar to what I did on the last um, site. Um, okay, should I take public comment? I would definitely open it up, just give folks the okay. opportunity. Um, okay. So the outstanding information, um, the footbridge that's shown, we don't have any detail regarding the footings or the cross section of that. And so any information, even if it's a, a standard spec of some sort that just explains it'll be like, four by four pressure treated posts that are you know sunk in the ground or it'll be helical piers or it'll be you know just something so that we have a design spec to include with the approval I think would be important. Um, the other thing is a uh, sequence of construction and what kind of I guess triggered this was I was you know ordinarily I'll always condition that the restoration be completed first so the the restoration area is designed first and then construction the other construction starts um in this case the restoration is is sort of like a um an added bonus in and I think it's kind of a, a mitigation for some of the riverfront impacts so um I'm not it's not a deal breaker, so to speak, but um, in the course of discussing this with Mickey earlier today, I guess one point of confusion was the fact that the existing driveway might be used for a period of time for the initial construction phase, which I was a little unsure um, because the construction entrance is shown coming in through the um, existing West Street development as opposed to off of Route 116. And so, it just needs to be clear like exactly what that access path is being used for in the initial initial phase and that's really important i know that driveway is paved but heavy equipment if we're carrying um materials and also is the pavement being taken out and sort of like what is the um what's going to be the um, construction sequence for access off of route 116 particularly because there's wetlands on either side um and the other thing I was concerned about relative to that is that when you come up that driveway immediately in front of it is where the rain gardens are proposed. And so compaction is a really serious issue there. Um, and so just understanding sort of that area is going to be protected. Where's the access road coming in? Is there going to be a construction pad there? Or am I overthinking this and it's going to be something very simple happening there 
for a brief period of time and that the primary access is going to be from the other side. So just trying to understand kind of how it's all going to be constructed and when the replication area and the invasives treatments and all that is going to occur. I like to see those things happening while construction is underway, as opposed to constructing the place and then like, oh, we'll get to the restoration three years from now. So just to make sure that they're sort of on the same or similar track. Um, the calcs we've already been over. Um, on the plan itself, the revised plan that was provided, the temporary and permanent impacts for the resource areas were the same. And to me, that seemed like it might have been a typographical error, but I just wanted to confirm what, what was going on there and also where snow storage was going to be on the site to confirm that. Um, and there may have been a notation, and I apologize because the plans were really large and reading them electronically, and I've been... Um, just unable to find those fine details. Um, and then I do have a series of conditions that I have been working up and I sent some of those along to Mickey. Um, a lot of them pertain again to the turtle protection area. Do you want me to read through these now or we can go over these when it comes time to actually issue? Yeah, I think there's enough that's kind of outstanding in terms of information. I think we should hold off on these until it's time to issue. Okay. Um, these are all really good thoughts, Erin. Um, Mickey, is this all uh, making sense to you? Yeah, it is. Okay. Can I just briefly share the plan or Erin, do you want to do that? Or do you want to pull that up quickly? Um, it's so big, Mickey, if you have a way to share it that works and you can like navigate it, because what's happening is Erin's remoting into another computer and it's just really hard to deal with big plans. Okay, um, so, so uh, you should be able to see the site plan. Um, so yeah. one of the things is that um, for the, I, I'll, I'll provide you a, a more clear sequence that Aaron was requesting, but the, uh, the existing driveway um, runs through here. You can see this, we're gonna rip up all the pavement and restore this whole area as wetlands, grass, rain gardens. Uh, my thinking was that because there's an existing building here and there's some demolition, that that would probably take place with the existing driveway. But then as soon as they do that work, they're going to have to start roughing in all the stormwater controls. So the driveway then becomes unusable. Um, so I, I'll, I'll provide um, a sequence plan that Aaron suggested. That's a good idea. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to pause for a second unless there's something pressing on a detail of one of those co um, conditions and just open this up for any public questions or comments. Is that okay with everyone? <coughs> Aaron, sound good? Okay. Yeah, so if you're here about 395, the uh, project proposed at 395 West Street and you have a question or comment um, relative to the protection of wetlands at the site, um, please raise your hand. Oh, Ken. Oh. All right, hold on a second. Ken, you're already in the meeting, so you should be able to unmute yourself and talk. A couple of questions. One is, and uh, Mickey referred to the Phragmites at, right when he first started, but I wasn't clear how he, well, let me first say, we're the abutters immediately to the north. Uh, just with the pumping station road separating us. And we have substantial wetlands, which would be ideal habitat for Phragmites. And I've been looking with, for years now with some apprehension at that large, wonderful pond of Phragmites just up the road from us. And I'd just like to hear Mickey say a little bit more about how he's gonna continue to isolate that pet pond. And then the second question I have, looking at the plans, it looks that they're essentially planning to clear cut the whole top area around the construction. And I wanted to check if that's true because there's some very nice trees there that don't seem to be on the footprint of the building they're putting in. And in this day and age, it seems the town should be doing everything to preserve mature trees. Uh, when possible. 
And certainly the plans for plantings afterwards are just for a couple of very small trees, but nothing of the kind of swamp white oaks and other large trees that are currently there. Okay. Um, thanks, Ken. Thanks for being here. Mickey, do you want to address? Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Um, Ken, so um, the area north of the driveway, so closer to your house, is uh, that, that marsh is mostly Phragmites. And I put together a plan that uh, we're, we're planning to pull out the driveway that goes into the site and restore that as wetlands. And I was a little concerned that the Phragmites would expand. So I put together a plan that if a Phragmites expands into this restored wetland, that we can kind of knock it back. But it, it, it's a very large area of Phragmites that um, is not proposed to be uh, fully treated under this proposal. It, it's, it's, a, it's a large area between um, this site and the pumping station. Um, the site development has no clear cut. There's, it's re, reusing the existing footprint that's already cleared. Uh, the only trees that are proposed to be cut in the whole project are, um, there's a couple of Norway spruce that are dead or dying and white pine trees that are already dead along the driveway. Uh, and I put a note on the plan just to remove those, but there's no live trees that are, that are proposed to be cut. There's no forest clearing at all. Okay. Um, this the Phragmites spreading thing came up in our in our last conversation about this. Can you just clarify? Sorry, I'm not up on the detail of this, but so you wrote into the plan that if the Phragmites starts to spread into the newly connected wetland area, you have a mechanism to knock that back. I think is what you said, Mickey. Can what's the detail yeah. on that? So what I, what I did was I. I provided the commission a memo um, on, it, one, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember which commission member asked for some details. So I provided um, for any woody invasive plants, they would be cut uh, by hand and then wiped with herbicide. So no overspray. Um, and that for herbaceous vegetation, the invasives that are in that whole riverfront area, there would be a glove wipe system. So basically you take a, a, a cotton glove, dip it in herbicide, wipe it on those plants. There are very few of those on this particular site. And then for the Phragmites, uh, Japanese knotweed and multiflora rose uh, and species which you can't do stem wicking or wiping, those would be oversprayed and use a dye. Um, so that, and uh, I, I suggested that, that the herbicides that could be used would be either clear cast or glyphosate or uh, th those, those are the two that work for those species. So um, I don't in anticipate treating the Phragmites, but I think in the long term, probably want, we're gonna wanna keep them out of the um, wetland mitigation area. So if they kind of march to the south uh, I'd like to have the ability to uh, hold them back. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna change Ken to an attendee. Thank you for being here, Ken. Are there any other, um, we have six other people in, a, in attendance. Does anyone else have a comment or question um, relevant to this application? If you do, please raise your hand. Okay. All right, um, Michelle, do you have a question? I just, I just want to head off um, maybe a future question regarding the herbicide since we were just talking about it. Um, I saw that Aaron has a condition in there, but just to clarify, like the information needed. I know you mentioned glyphosate, so that's you know I guess what we're looking for is the specific formulation. So Roundup Rodeo, it wouldn't be Roundup, it'd be Rodeo. And then, you know, the chemical and the, the breakdown of everything in that chemical. So if you have, you know, Rodeo has a, yeah, exactly. So I just wanted to clarify that just because you just mentioned glyphosate, but there's a lot more to it than just that. So we're just looking for that kind of level of specificity. 
Yeah, so Michelle, if I can just answer one, one of the things that I had put into the memo to the commission is that um, before you uh, allow to treat the herbicides in a wetland, uh, you need a DEP license to apply. It's an annual license and they would review um, the quantity and whatever herbicide you're using. And so uh, any year in which uh, that herbicide is going to be applied, that would there would be a license with a copy to the commission. Uh, and that has to be submitted by um, not just a, a, an herbicide applicator, but an aquatic applicator that's required. So um, I, I basically, you know, I would assume that there would be conditions in that um, that Aaron would put in, but it, it's whatever the formulation uh, would be discussed with the DEP for that specific case. And that would be in the, that would be in the license to apply. It would, it would have the quantity, the herbicide, um, whether it's clear cast or by or glyphosate or whatever else is approved in a given year by DEP. Yeah, I tried to head that off at the past with some conditions, and I didn't share all of them with Mickey, but they're um, relative to getting the formulations approved. And in this case, since DEP is involved and NHESP is involved, I think it's it just makes sense to make sure that those are rolled into the order of conditions to make sure that they're okay is um, required prior to the application. Um, and then, of course, I also included the sensitive area restrictions. Um, as far as scheduling on days when precipitation or strong winds are forecasted um, and then being applied by um, work being overseen by a wetland scientist. So there's definitely a couple additional conditions in there relative to that that I, and I've been sort of chipping away at it and adding some back in there. So um, just to point that out. And if I could just say, Michelle, that I'm not sure they're gonna need to spray the frag in that area. I, I think it's, it makes sense to have a condition that permits that um, if it becomes an issue. So, you know, knowing how invasive that plant gets, it, it's probably gonna, you know, try to march right across uh, the restoration area. So it, it'd be good to have a condition to allow that work to take place if it's needed. I agree, thank you for answering that. So. Okay, so it sounds like we kind of, we have a plan. Mickey, I feel like it's clear what we need to move forward. And then at the next meeting, we will just review these orders of conditions and hopefully move forward with this. Um, thank you for the attention to detail and for working with Aaron to get this to the place it is. Um, the plans when I can get them to load in my computer look great. <laughs> okay, um, Aaron, are you comfortable with that? Um, yes. Yes, okay. I am. Thank you. Okay. All right. And thank so, you, Mickey, for um, putting up with my emails today. It's always hard trying to juggle getting comments to you and revisions and stuff. And I want to appreciate, I appreciate all the back and forth at the last minute today. Yeah, we need to get it right. Uh, it's going to be an ongoing condition, right? Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so commissioners, I think we're looking for a motion to continue this hearing um, for 395 West Street to August 10th at 7.55. Oh boy. I move to continue 35 West Street hearing to August 10th, 2022 at 7.55 p.m. Second. We got a second from Larry. All right, voice vote. Michelle. Aye. Uh, Fletcher. Aye. Andre. Aye. Larry. Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mickey. See you next time. Good night. Good night. All right. And final announcement. If you are here about the hearing for 46 Fearing Ave, that has been continued to September 
14th at 7.30 p.m. Um, if you are in a butter and you've already been notified, you will not be notified again. Um, so if you're interested in following that hearing, your best bet is to mark September 14th on your calendar and double check our agenda um, before the meeting. Uh, but it should be starting around 7.30 p.m. on September 14th. All right, Aaron. So I don't think we've made a motion to continue it. Oh, sorry. That's okay. I'm exhausted. Um, I'll, make, no, I'll make the motion to continue the uh, 46 Ferry Street notice of intent to September 14th, 2022 at 730. Second. Okay, voice vote. Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. And I'm also aye. All right, I'll try to burn through this because I know you guys are tired. Um, that was a lot. Um, so I didn't put this on the agenda tonight because uh, there's still negotiations ongoing, but I think it would be a good measure, safety measure to have a motion to um, put it on for the, oops, that was a carryover, um, for the- Eight, 10. Eight, 10, 22 agenda. All right, commissioners, we need a motion if you can read exactly yeah, what's on the screen. I can do that. So you want another, um, you want me to read the whole thing? Yes, yes please. please. Yeah, I'll make a motion for 52 Fearing Street, DEP SORAD to move the schedule to an executive session pursuant of GLC 30A section 21A3 to discuss strategy to respect to litigation at 52 Fearing Street regarding recently issued DEP SORAD to be on the August 10th, 2022 agenda. Second. second. Yeah. I, got, I got Andre, did you say second, Andre? Okay, second from Andre, voice vote, Andre. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. And I'm also aye. So uh, this 8-10 meeting is going to be a big one, huh? Yeah. Okay. I think there were already like four hearings and then we just added two more. But I and think the two, that we just, the two that we just went through in detail, I'm hoping we can get through those orders of conditions quickly. Um, Aaron, is there anything else that we want to cover in this meeting? Y yes, if possible. Um... And it's pretty quick. Um, so I don't have the certificate of compliance pulled up for Canton. Um, we did receive the request for certificate of compliance for Canton Ave, and that would be to close out basically the old order of conditions, essentially saying that it's no longer valid. Um, I would prefer to do that maybe well I don't know if I want to kick the can on that one um so yeah I guess we should deal with it tonight if you can bear with me for just a moment I just want to make sure I get the language right um for the I didn't have a whole ton of time to um get the detail on this but I'm gonna oops okay take your time just want to make sure I get the language right on the certificate to make sure that it's stated correctly. Okay. Um, Want to do it first thing in our next meeting, Erin? No, it's okay. I've got it. I think I've got it. Um, okay. It's just a little... I'm having technical difficulties with, with the... For some reason, I can't... Um, something's funky with my computer. I think I've got to restart it. But this is, this is the language that we would want. Can you guys see my screen? 
Yeah, the above referenced order of conditions is lapsed and is therefore no longer valid and the work regulated by it was never started. Correct. Yep. Um, it's not exact apples to apples to the situation because there was a violation, but um, the violation wasn't basically starting construction, it was clearing. So I think that that would be the most appropriate for the Canton Ave to issue a certificate of compliance um, for the order of conditions on the subdivision at Canton Ave stating that um, we're issuing the certificate of compliance because the order of conditions lapsed and is no longer valid. I think a so moved will work in that situation, Commissioner. So moved. Second. All right, voice vote. Larry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Andre. Aye. And I'm also aye. Perfect. Thank you guys for bearing with me through that. Um, and then the last item is certificate of compliance for, um, oops. Oh, Sorry, guys. So on a certificate of compliance. I, I prefer that. I prefer that to the certificate of compliance. There's no compliance there. Oh man, they're famous. Um, let me see what happened. I, I don't know why it's not letting me open PowerPoint. Okay, so it's for 74 um, East Leverett Road. It's the site uh, single family house that was built um, adjacent to the Cushman Brook. Um, I've been having discussions with the developer. Um, the site is stable. The problem was that there was uh, um, a, the catch basin still had erosion controls around it and it had sediment in there that needed to be cleaned out. He was out there and cleaned it. There's also a pile of stone um, that is next to the driveway and I was asking them what's happening with that. They're putting it in a garden which is behind the house outside of CONCOM jurisdiction but it's taking them some time to move it. So I'm comfortable issuing the certificate of compliance with ongoing conditions subject to um, the stone being removed from the riverfront area. Okay, oh, so move that. Yeah, so, so move Thank it. Okay. My computer is gonna die. My computer is gonna die too, let's do it. Yeah. Go, go. So moved, we need a second. I so, uh, yeah. Second. Second. All right, oh, Fletcher got the second. Voice vote, Michelle. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Andre, also an I. Is that it? Is that it, Aaron? 5% uh, That is us. We just need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn, anyone? I'll make I the motion to adjourn. to adjourn. 921. Okay. Second. Second. <laughs> Who got it? Andre? Voice <laughs> vote. Andre. Hi. Fletcher. Hi. Michelle. Hi. Larry. Hi. All right. M and I. Always a pleasure, you guys. Great thank you work. so much right. for your work and your thank hard you, volunteer you. work. Yeah, thanks, take everyone. care, Larry. Take care. Last, last, your last one, huh?